Amaduhu wa nusallu ala rasulihil kareem A'uzu billahi minash shaitanir rajim Bismillahir rahmanir rahim Our guest speaker retired justice Maulana Mufti Muhammad Taki Uthman Maulana Siddiq Ahmad Nasir Mufti Wasim Imams respected elders my dear brothers and sisters Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. My task this evening is to, first of all, welcome each and every one of you on behalf of our Imam and the members of the executive of the Larumain Jamaat to identify our young brother who just recited from Al Quran, Brother Abdullah Rahman. And for those who are members of the Larumain Jamaat, fondest memories come to us when we remember him leading us in Tarawih Salah here in our masjid. Our Imam, Imam Yasin, who rendered uh, the opening dua uh, invoking Allah's blessings on the proceedings here tonight and to introduce my second task is really to introduce our guest speaker for me to do that in a comprehensive way I would be eating into the speaking time and I will not do that just to say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us all of us with a very very a wonderful opportunity to be present here tonight at the Larumain Masjid as members of the audience to listen to an international scholar, an international Islamic scholar. We in Trinidad and Tobago are extremely privileged to have him visiting our shores through the auspices of Darul Ilm Limited and Manzil Cooperative Society. Our brother on the stage, Brother Shiraz, is one of the driving forces behind the Manzil Cooperative Society. He has been here for a few days and inshallah he shall be departing tomorrow. Justice, retired Justice Maulana Mufti Muhammad Taki Uthman is an eminent Hanafi Islamic scholar from Pakistan. He has served as a judge on the Sharia appellate bench of the Supreme Court of Pakistan and also as a judge of the Federal Court of Pakistan. He is an expert in the fields of Islamic jurisprudence, economics, hadith and tasawuf. Tasawuf has to do with spiritual matters. He also held a number of positions on the boards of prestigious Islamic institutions. He received his degree in Islamic education, which is equivalent to a Doctor of Philosophy from Darul Uloom Karachi in 1961. He also holds a master's degree in Arabic literature from Punjab University and an LLB Bachelor of Laws degree from Karachi University. He pioneered the concept of Islamic Bank in Pakistan when he introduced Mizan Bank. And he has also written countless, numerous rather, books in Arabic, Urdu and English on is, uh, vital Islamic topics in addition to a large number of articles on Islamic ba banking and finance published in many journals and magazines. I was reminded uh, tonight as I came in, uh, his father, Muf the late Mufti Muhammad Shafi, he was the late Grand Mufti of Pakistan. And he did tafsir of Quran in eight volumes, but did that in Urdu. And uh, our uh, visiting scholar, Mufti Sahib, he has translated uh, his father's works in English. 
and I was told to tell this audience that for the last eight years, the Takarigua Masjid, have, uh, they have been reading from this publication for the past eight years and they have reached the sixth volume. And uh, I thought that I should mention this because sometimes one does works and one labors very, very hard, never knowing where the fruits of the labor will be. So it is very, very interesting to note that Takarigua Masjid has been utilizing this book for the past eight years every morning. Alhamdulillah. Uh, the, in addition to that, Mufti Sahib conducts a weekly session for the public in, interested in spiritual improvement. And uh, I also took note of the fact that uh, he holds several positions, just to give you an indication of his international reputation quickly. Um, he's a permanent member of the Islamic Fiqh Academy in Jeddah, uh, Saudi Arabia. He is the Vice President of Darul Uloom Karachi in Karachi. Uh, he is Chairman of the Sharia Standard Council in uh, Accounting and Auditing Organization of Islamic Financial Institutions in Bahrain, uh, the UAE, and uh, he is chairman of the Sharia Board of the Bahrain Monetary Agency, which is now the Central Bank of Bahrain. He is chairman of the Sharia Board of Amana Investments Limited in Sri Lanka, and chairman of the Sharia Board of the Abu Dhabi Islamic Bank. He is a member of the Sharia Supervisory Board Guidance Financial Group of the United States of America, Chairman of the Sharia Board, Mizan Bank Limited in Pakistan, and uh, serves on the board of HSBC Amana Finance in Dubai, Chairman of the Sharia Board, uh, Bank Islami Pakistan Limited in Pakistan, and he also is affiliated with the Jamiat Ul Ulama of the United States of America. And I can go on and on, you know, the, um, uh, a list of the books, uh, English, Arabic, Urdu, and these are some, and they have only reached number 43. So you understand what I mean when I say that we are blessed tonight and we are greatly privileged. I want to uh, offer a special welcome to Mufti Saab, and I now take pleasure in asking him to address us. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah in Ahmaduhu wa nasta'inuh. Wa nasta'gfiruhu wa nu'minu bihi wa natawakkalu alayhi. Wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyati a'malina. Man yahdihillahu falamudilla lah. Wa man yudlilhu falahadiya lah. وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا وسندنا ونبينا ومولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحن قسمنا بينهم معيشتهم في الحياة الدنيا ورفعنا بعضهم فوق بعض درجات ليتخذ بعضهم بعضا سخرية ورحمة ربك خير مما يجمعون آمنت بالله صدق الله مولانا العظيم وصدق رسوله النبي الكريم وعلى ونحن على ذلك من الشاهدين والشاكرين والحمد لله رب العالمين my dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. I am here in your beautiful country for the last four days. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed me with the opportunity to be here 
among my Muslim brothers living in this part of country of the world and also to meet them and to talk to them about different aspects of our deen that is Islam. I I am grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and of and to those who have arranged these memorable opportunities for me to meet my brothers and to discuss with them different aspects of Islam. And this is perhaps my last night in this country and probably I will be flying tomorrow and this is the last occasion on which I have an opportunity to speak to you. My different brothers have asked me to speak this night about the Islamic, the concept of Islamic finance. In the perspective of what is going on globally in the form of the financial crisis that is being faced by all the countries of the world, not to speak one of them. You all know that, that the world is passing through a very grave crisis in the field of finance. And it is said that it is the biggest recession after 1930s that the world is facing today. Some people think that this is a pure mundane phenomena and it has nothing to do with religion as it has nothing to do with the with Islamic principles or Islamic precepts which is in fact not true. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a deen that is Islam which is different in other different from other religions of the world in the sense that other religions like Christianity, Hinduism, Judaism and so on. All these religions just relate to one's individual life and not the whole of individual life but only that part of life that relates to his beliefs and to some rituals offer, offered in the places of worship. Once they are in the places of worship they observe their religion, but they, if they are in the market, if they are in the uh, political field, if they are in social, socio-economic uh, concerns, they have nothing to do with their religion, because their religion does not offer any specific guidance in these fields. But unlike of them, Islam that is represented by, by the teachings of the Holy Quran and the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is not restricted to the acts of worship or rituals only. It has given us guidance in every field of, of our life. It has given guidance to our econ economy, it has given guidance to our politics, it has given guidance to our social behavior and to our mor morality, to our ethics and so on. Therefore, the present cri economic crisis cannot be, cannot be considered as something quite aloof 
from the guidance provided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In fact, this is not a sufficient time to analyze and to explain all the factors that have caused this crisis. But if you analyze this crisis briefly, I would say after you know studying the causes of this crisis, what can be uh, can be uh, you know obvious to anyone is that this is caused because the economy has been established on debts, debts over debts, debts over debts, and then that they uh, when the debts faced default, then those debts are transferred by sale to one another. Debts are sold. And this created an, an, a, 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 you know, a panic in the economy. And it affected also the stocks of the companies. And all of you know that the stock market always runs on the basis of speculations. Speculations are made on the basis of short sales, blank sales, etc. So the, if I, you analyze, you will find that there are three main causes. One is the debt-based economy that has created, created money without any asset before behind it, without any backing of assets behind it. And the second is the speculative transactions carried out on the basis of short sales and blank sales. These are the basic causes if you analyze the crisis. And if we turn to Islamic injunctions, Islamic principles, first of all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Rasulullah have prohibited us from incurring debts without a genuine need. Rasulullah has always discouraged living beyond the means. And that is why once Rasulullah was sitting and a funeral, a janaza was presented before him. Rasulullah was told that this person who has died has incurred such a debt that he did not, you know, did not pay it, repay the, the debt. And uh, he has, has left nothing to set off the debts. Rasulullah refused to offer janaza on that person. Why? Because he said, why did this person incur such a debt that he could, that, uh, could not be repaid? And therefore he said that some other person will, uh, will pray janaza, the salatul janaza on that person and I will not pray janaza. Then Abu Qatada radiallahu ta'ala who stood up and said, Ya Rasulullah, I take upon myself that I will repay all his debt. Inshallah. Then Rasulullah said, if you are promising to do that, then I'll offer janaza, offer, I'll, I'll pray janaza prayer for him. So this indicates that Islam does discourages to incur debts without genuine needs. However, if a debt is created, it must be based on some assets. And it cannot be done that money is exchanged for money with increase, that is riba, that is interest. And this interest has, uh, has played a vital role in creating an artificial economy in this world. It is not enough time to explain this aspect, but it is known to everybody who has studied economics. This was the first Secondly, the 
principle laid down by the Holy Quran and by the ahadith of Rasulullah is that you cannot sell a commodity that you do not own. Not only this, it is also established that you cannot sell a commodity that you do not possess. Merely ownership is not enough. If you have owned a particular commodity but he, you did not take possession of it, it was not delivered to you, it is not allowed in Sharia to sell that commodity. Because Sharia says that al ghunm bil ghurm al kharaju bil daman unless you take the risk of that commodity you cannot earn profit through it if you take possession then you have borne the risk of that commodity in the sense that if that commodity is destroyed then you will suffer the loss now when you uh, undertaken the responsibility and the risk of that commodity, now you are allowed to sell it and earn profit on it. But if you did not have to possession of that commodity, you cannot. So this is one of the basic principles enshrined by the Sunnah of the Holy Prophet on which all the fuqaha, all the jurists of Muslim Ummah are unanimous. And if you see in the market, in commodity market, in equity market, everywhere, the, uh, the commodities and the shares are sold and bought without having ownership. One person, you know, purchases the shares on, at 8 o'clock, for example, and he did not take delivery thereof. And he sells it on 9 o'clock with a profit margin. This is a speculation. And this is speculation causes the upheavals in the economic atmosphere. And that is why ye, the world is facing this crisis today. Now, the main, one of the main principles that have been laid down by, by the Holy Quran is to refrain from riba, that is from interest. And I have, in my Juma, uh, Juma talk, I have explained a little bit of the prohibitions of riba and also the, the philosophy lying behind it. But now, I intend today to answer a question that is frequently asked when the people are told that interest is prohibited in Sharia. The question is that if we do away with interest-based system, what is the system with us that can be in place as alternative to the interest-based system? So much so that, you know, some 30 years ago, the people used to say that it is a utopian idea that an economy can be based without interest. An economy can be run or financial institution can be run without interest. But the, they, those people did not know that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited interest and riba, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew that the time will come, a time will come when the ribas will be so rampant in the world that it will be very difficult to do away with it. So had it been impossible to do away with interest, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not have prohibited this because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says La nafsan illa wasaha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not burden any person beyond his ability. Therefore, as a Muslim, we believed and we still believe that interest is an evil and there are many alternatives available in Sharia that can be in place 
as an alternative to it. Alhamdulillah, since last 30 years, Muslims were able to establish not only on theoretical plane, but also on practical basis, they established different Islamic financial institutions, different Islamic banks throughout the world. The first Islamic bank that was established in Jeddah, that is Islamic Development Bank, and then there are a number of institutions followed. Now, alhamdulillah, there are more than 200 Islamic financial institutions working on this globe. Many of them are in Muslim countries, and some are working even in non-Muslim countries. So much so that all the huge conventional banks, interest-based banks, are in line, in queue, to establish their Islamic windows or Islamic units or Islamic entities. Once I was in Bahrain, and uh, the head of an, a very well-known international bank, approached me and asked me to advise him how to establish an Islamic uh, unit within that bank. He was a non-Muslim. So I asked him, why are you asking me this? Because you do not believe in Islam. So what has prompted, prompted you to establish an Islamic branch or Islamic unit or Islamic window? He said, it is so simple. Our clientele here in Bahrain, hey, they, emphasize, they, you know, pushing us, they are pushing us to establish this. And they are saying, unless you establish an Islamic unit, unless you establish an Islamic window, we will not be, uh, you know, uh, will not be uh, transacting with you. So, we, this is a uh, demand of our clients, and therefore we are doing this. Now, every non-Muslim bank is seeing that there is an emerging market in the Muslim countries. And wherever Muslims live, there is an, uh, an increasing demand for Islamic banking or Islamic financial institutions. Therefore, they are in line, in queue, to establish Islamic windows. Not because they believe in this system. Not because they are Muslims, but because they are seeing an emerging market and they want to capture it. So they are establishing this. So it is not a theoretical thing that has been, you know, mentioned in the books only. Now it has come into practice. But what are the basic difference between conventional riba-based financial system and between real Islamic system. What are the alternatives on the basis of which a financial institution may be run? First of all, the ideal alternative to interest-based transactions is the partnership between the borrower and the lender. Partnership in, in profits and losses. This is the ideal mode of financing according to Sharia. And this is the thing that brings equitable distribution of wealth between the people. As I explained today in today's Juma, you know, interest-based system always is, is always in the favor of the rich and against the poor. But if the banking system is established on the basis of equity, equity participation, then the, all the depositors of the bank will be the partners of the bank. The bank will be the partner of the persons who take money from it, who are financed by the bank. And whatever profit is generated by those who, who take money from the banks, Whatever profit is generated is distributed equitably between them 
and between the bank and the bank will distribute that uh, it between it and the uh, depositors this is what is called musharaka or mudaraba so this is the ideal mode of financing according to sharia had it been in place inst instead of interest no such crisis has ever evolved because uh, there is no artificial money every transaction has its basis on musharaka and the flow of wealth comes from the from the top to the bottom in the present system all the profits goes to the pockets of the of the rich people and the poor persons depositors get only a negligible uh, proportion of the profit that is 7% 8% whatever rate uh, interest which is much less than the inflation rate you know and they paid back when they go to the market and purchase something then the uh, it is the interest they have you know earned is included in the cost of that production therefore they repay that interest again to the producers and in nutshell they get nothing but if it had been on the basis of equity and profit and loss participation then the profit would have been distributed to, uh, through the bank to the common depositors and it it would uh, you know di divert the flow of the wealth from bottom from top to the bottom and it would have would have been a an inequitable distribution of wealth but unfortunately the big you know capitalists who did not want the general public to participate in their profits they have developed this interest based system and uh, another factor just i have just uh, pointed out was that this riba based system always creates artificial money by creation of money 100 dollars 100 dollars same 100 dollars are given as loan to a same to b same to c same to d same to e there are actually only 100 dollars but they are you know given to different pe people on the basis of assumption only and it in this way the actually the supply of money uh, goes you know far away from the reality this creates inflation this creates you know a number of economic evils in the equity participation there is no question of of uh, artificial money being created by in this manner and therefore it is not possible in equity based economy or participation basis uh, financing that such crisis may, may you know come into existence but unfortunately we are living in a system that has grabbed the whole world and in uh, the interest based system is so uh, you know in uh, engraved in the in our lives throughout the world that even if a, if a bank islamic bank is established he needs you know in order to transfer their their money needs some american banks that he should deposit his money in an american bank so that he may transfer the check from one place to another one so therefore you know if we are not able for example to establish our financial institutions on the basic of on the basis of part equitable participation is there any other way by which we could avoid the clear prohibition of interest the present day scholars have developed some other methods also for that purpose and one of them is murabaha murabaha means that you sell a commodity 
on on a on a margin of profit this close to the client so they say that in normal uh, banks and in financial institutions if someone wants to purchase cotton for example he wants to purchase cotton and he wants financing for that pur purchase normal conventional banks give gives him a loan on the basis of interest and he goes to the market and purchases the cotton and you know it starts paying interest to the bank this is the normal practice so if we cannot establish for some reason or the other the true musharaka then the scholars have said that instead of giving him a loan it is allowed in sharia that bank purchases the cotton from the market and sells it to the client sells the cotton to the client on a markup that is on a profit and it may be a deferred sale deferred payment sale and the price may be increased to the uh, to you know uh, to accommodate a profit to earn a profit for the institution this is called murabaha sales but there are very strict conditions for this transaction for example i have already said that you cannot sell a commodity that you do not own you cannot sell a commodity unless you possess it and take the risk of that commodity unless you take the risk of this commodity you cannot sell it in the market but if you do it after possession then and you you claim a profit on this deferred payment sale it is allowed in sharia so many uh, islamic financial institutions who are not yet able to bring about the equity participation system they are doing this because this is allowed in sharia although this is not an ideal this is not the ultimate goal of islamic financial movement yet in order to refrain from the clear prohibition of riba this is allowed this is permissible and this if someone does this then it will uh, will uh, uh, he will save himself from the uh, prohibition of riba one point i wanted i want to clarify here many people who do not uh, who are not well uh, uh, versed in islamic jurisprudence sometimes say that murabaha is not permissible because they say that it is you know picking up the nose from the other side you know so therefore it is not allowed but in fact allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the holy quran when he prohibited riba it is very interesting that he uh, has quoted the uh, what they quoted the people of jahiliyat who used to say innama al bay'u mislu ar riba and people of jahiliyat used to say in fact sale is like riba sale is like interest the question arises how this they said that the sale is akin to riba or uh, similar to riba this point has been clarified by the uh, by the authentic classic mufassirin a well known mufassir imam ibn abi hatim rahimahullah taala he has quoted some sahaba aur tabi'in to say that what is the background of their saying that sale is similar to riba they said that they used to charge a higher price for a commodity if it is purchased on deferred payment basis this was the practice that for example 
if someone wants to purchase uh, wheat, purchase wheat, but he cannot give the money uh, as on spot, can give the price on spot. The price of the wheat is, for example, 10 dirham. So if he cannot uh, pay the price instantly, then the seller would say that I can give you, uh, you know, I can sell you on deferred payment basis, you pay me after three months. But the price would be 11 instead of 10. Then he accepted and the sale took place. This was allowed by Islam. This was allowed by Sharia. But when the debt became mature, after three months, the time of pay payment arrived, then the person is still unable to pay. Then at that point of time, the seller would say, either you give me the price right now, or you must increase in the price. Ataqvi am turbi. Whether, you know, are you paying right now? If not, you have to increase the price from 11 to 12 or 13. This was prohibited by Islam. The first sale was not prohibited. But when he increased the amount from 11 to 12, an increase from 10 to 11 was never prohibited. Was never you know, prohibited by Sharia or Islam. But when at the time of payment he wanted more respite, more time, then 11, uh, you know, charging more price from 11 to 12 was prohibited and said, this is the riba. So they said, innamal bay'o mislo riba. And in the first sale, the in which we in you increase the price from 10 to 11, you allowed it. But when we say that we are going to increase for more time, you disallow it. Innamal bay'o mislo riba. This was the, the background of their saying in Amal Bayah Maswarriba. Which means that even in the time of the Holy Prophet wasallam, the increase in price for deferred payment sale was allowed. But if once a price is fixed, it cannot be increased for more time given to the uh, purchaser and for which riba prohibition came. And therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered the question, وَأَحَلَّ اللَّهُ الْبَيَا وَحَرَّمَ الرِّبَا you, have nobody, you are nobody to ask where, why the, uh, the first sale was allowed and second sale was disallowed. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have explained the wisdom behind it, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opted to say that since it is the order and command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you, you are nobody to ask why this is allowed and this is not allowed. وَحَلَّ اللَّهُ الْبَيَا وَعَرَّ مَرِّبَا So, is it therefore, increase in the price. Why? Now, give me you, uh, uh, let, us, let me give you the basic reason for that. You know, Sharia has, de has dealt money and commodity on different discourse. They have different rules, different regulations, different principles. If you transact money in exchange of money, you cannot even charge a profit. You cannot charge a profit of one penny. This is rip. But if you purchase commodity for, for money, then it is up to the seller and purchaser to agree on whatever price they, are, they can agree. So if there is a transaction of, of commodity against money, this is allowed and in the transfer of money to money is not allowed. And it has been practiced in during the uh, Islamic periods, different Islamic periods, so much so that even in the last uh, caliphates of Khulafat Osmania, the, there was uh, a, you know, a schedule given by the government, it was the Islamic government, and has been discussed by Fuqaha in Radul Muhtar, etc., that uh, it was, you know, allowed and it was uh, acted upon in those days. 
So it is not correct to say that this is not halal or this is not permissible. If it is conducted with due, uh, due caution and observing all the conditions, as I told you, must be possessed, owned and possessed by the bank, by the financial institution, then it moraba at least relieves oneself from the clear prohibition of riba. Secondly, there are some areas in which the present scholars have developed different modes of financing, like, for example, for example home financing. Now, in our days, the people are more in need of homes, but they cannot afford to purchase homes. They are living on rented houses, and they sometimes resort to take loans on the basis of interest in order to acquire homes. But as an alternative to that system, the fuqaha have, uh, fuqaha of the contemporary fuqaha have developed a, a way, a leeway for the Muslims that in our, instead of borrowing money for, from the institution, it is possible and is practiced in different countries, that the house is purchased jointly by the financial institution and by the client. For example, a house is a value is 100,000. So it is purchased by bank and by, by bank or by the financial institution and the client jointly in the sense that the client offers 20% of the price, 20,000 for example. And 80,000 is contributed by the bank. Now the, ba the, the house is jointly owned between the two. The client owns 20% and the institution owns 80% jointly owned. After it's being jointly owned, the institution rents out its own share, that is 80%, for use to the client and charges a rent for that. At the same time, the bank gives the client an option to purchase different units of its own shares. For example, it, now it is 80% owned by the bank, and it is allowed for the client that he purchases more share of the, of the house from the bank. If we divide, for example, 80% of the bank into 10 shares, he purchases one share after every three months or four months or five months or whatever. So once he purchased 10% more, he became 30% owner and the bank remained 70% owner. He can charge only the rent of 70% now. The rent will be reduced to that extent. Then when he becomes 60% owner, the, the, uh, the client will be 40% owner and he will pay the rent only for 60%. And this process will go on until the client will become the full owner of the bank. Here, but it is necessary that if the bank owns jointly, owns the house jointly, then he must, must bear the risk of that house, risk of ownership related, related to the ownership of that house. And this is the way the... Uh, the, the basic uh, reason for the validity of the profit he is earning from the client. So this is another way of uh, financing that can be adopted, particularly in those fields in, the, in which the basic purpose of financing is not to, uh, to have an enterprise, a, a commercial enterprise, rather than it is uh, meant for financing to acquire homes or cars, etc. So this is another mode of financing. Similarly, there are Ijara and Isisna, they have, you know, their own details, and uh, I have fully, uh, you know, dis uh, discussed these modes of financing in detail in my, back, my book, An Introduction to Islamic Finance, which is, alhamdulillah, you know, has been uh, published and distributed throughout the world, and it explains how to act upon these modes of 
financing. Now, after saying, having said this, I would request my brothers and sisters living here that they should first of all appreciate the gravity of the sin of earning riba or paying riba. Earning riba is haram, paying riba is haram. لَعَنَ اللَّهُ آكِلَ الرِّبَا وَمُوكِلَهُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent his curse to those who eat riba or let others eat riba. That is, they pay riba. So therefore, first of all, the Muslims should appreciate the gravity of this sin and uh, they should not neglect it because it is a, it is a very severe it has, it, uh, you know, has a very severe punishment that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has declared war against them. And in order to avoid this prohibition, they should try to establish their own institutions that deal according to the principles of Sharia. And alhamdulillah, there is an increasing increasing uh, trend throughout the Muslim world that the financial institutions are, are being established. But I would warn you about one aspect which is very serious also, that although there is an increasing uh, tendency among the Muslims to establish Islamic financial institutions, but sometimes they do it in hurry in enthusiasm. They are over-enthusiastic towards establishing such an institution. And they establish it without fulfilling the basic requirements because it is not uh, just you know, switching over an institute. It requires many, uh, many, uh, many efforts before it is launched. First of all, the people working in that institution must know what they are going to do. And they must have, uh, must have education and training about Islamic financing. And there should be some reliable ulama to oversee the whole process because these are transactions which are very delicate. If you there are some transactions in which you, if you go one step further, you will fall into the riba. You will fall into the interest. So there are, likewise, uh, like I said to you, that if the bank does not possess the commodity, and there are many who, you know, just heard that murabaha is a mode of financing, thus they use their word of murabaha without having the ownership or the possession of the commodity. There is no commodity at all. And they, say, they are saying that we are doing Muraba, and that's it. So this is a deception. This is, uh, must be, this must be avoided. So therefore, it uh, should not be done in hurry. It should be all the basic requirements of these transactions must be fulfilled. A proper training should be there, should be in place. Proper men, men power, having full knowledge of Islamic finance must be there, without which I, uh, I fear that these financial institutions may fall into errors, grave errors. And it, they did fall in many places, because I am in this field since last 25 years. And I have seen what happened to many institutions, that they claim to be Islamic. They claim that they, they are following these principles of Sharia. Still, they are deviating from it and they are not fulfilling the, uh, its uh, full requirements. Therefore, uh, it should be done very, with very, uh, in very precautious manner. And, but I hope that as, uh, you know, there is, uh, if there is a uh, appreciation of the fact, and if there is, uh, if the uh, Muslims are anxious, truly, to establish such institutions, inshallah, it will not be very difficult to, uh, to bring 
such institutions in place here also in this country. And I am, alhamdulillah, happy that many Muslim brothers are, uh, you know, they are uh, on their way to establish, so to have trainings. And I am happy that before establishing the, uh, the program, they are, you know, uh, making efforts to train the people, train the, uh, the man, uh, manpower in this behalf. So, must the, the Muslim, I would uh, appeal to the Muslims that they should cooperate with them and they should uh, uh, appreciate that they are doing for the betterment of the society, betterment of the community, and inshallah it will bring fruits. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all tawfiq to observe all his commands and prohibitions in due, in letter and spirit. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq. وسبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين
that money is borrowed. That is their money that you are using to purchase the land. Is that so? No, no. In that case, the bank first will uh, will purchase the land okay. for okay. himself. Okay. For himself. The bank will purchase the land, but what if it is the possession of the land? Is okay. If if it is a bare land, yeah. uh, you know, merely uh, you know, uh, the deed will will uh, will be the possession. But if it is a constructed house, okay, that constructed house, unless it is taken into possession in the sense that uh, the uh, the owner of the house has transferred it and gave its possession to the bank, unless the bank uh, uh, takes the possession of that uh, constructed house, he cannot sell it. Sorry. Um, you were saying that money, um, it will be accepted as money once it is accepted in wider society. But if something, um, let's say if something haram is accepted in wider society as money, what we are Muslims do? No, if it, it is something haram, for example, uh, some uh, you know wine, wine, for example, yes. that cannot be done. So what would be should be should be uh, among those things that are permissible. Final question, I, I would like to pose to Mufti Sahib just before we cut off. Uh, the international financial crisis is obviously very uncertain. What are your views? Do you have any views on this? How is this going to actually reveal itself? In fact, I cannot predict anything. <laughs> because, you know, unless uh, the, uh, the unfortunate effect, unfortunate fact is that in order to, uh, you know, cure this this crisis, the same tools are being used. You know, the deaths have been have been you know, the basic cause of the crisis, and now even in a bailout program, for example, they uh, will create more debt. So debt over debt over debt over debt. So you can you cannot you know cure the uh, <coughs> an ailment. By bringing another element of that of the similar kind of bomb. So therefore, uh, I think you know uh, whatever they are doing will not you know, will not cure the problem. And uh, unless they revert to the to the uh, to original position that <coughs> what has created it is this artificial money spent. Unless they control this, I I don't think they may be success may be successful in uh, dealing with crisis. But Allah knows best what is going to happen. On your behalf, I would like to thank Mufti Sahib uh, most pro profoundly for his discourse here tonight, and I'm sure that we have had an insight. What is very very um, evident and clear is that we have we as a community in Trinidad and Tobago. We are moving out of, um, not that we are, we, we are putting aside, we are moving beyond rituals and within the parameters of a lot of what we adhere to as Muslims. And we are now seeing uh, the Islamic principles, more particularly uh, Islamic economics, Islamic monetary system, Islamic financing, and such topics are now taking center stage, not in the masjids, but on the international scene. And we as Muslims, uh, we are well advised uh, to apprise ourselves of what is taking place because it, it seems, while it is uncertain where we are heading um, with the international economic crisis, what is certain is that the non-Muslim world will be wanting to hear more and more of what Islam has to offer in terms of governance generally. And this really uh, demonstrates the relevance of the learning of our scholars who have studied uh, Islamic economics, Islamic banking, Islamic finance and so on. And uh, we will now see our scholars uh, putting forward uh, the Islamic ideals and Islamic ideas for the rest of the world to consider. So we are actually um, in an experience that can be described as a pioneering experience here in Trinidad and Tobago with the visit of our Muslim Mufti side.
On your behalf, I would like to thank him. And we do hope, uh, inshallah, that uh, he will continue to educate the world uh, about Islamic finance. Because on the paper that I was given there, uh, I, I, I saw a footnote in that paper that states that if you deviate from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained, it means that we are doomed to failure and we are doomed to troubling times as we are now experiencing. Uh, and I'm sure that Mufti Sahib is at all times prepared to argue that Islamic financing is the only way out for the simple reason, the basic reason that it has been ordained by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين حين الله صلى على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد رب ارحمهما كما أربيانا صغارا اللهم آتنا في الدنيا حسنا وفي الآخرة حسنا وكن عذاب النار اللهم إنا نسألوك الجنة ونعوذ بك من النار يا خالق الجنة والنار برحمتك يا عزيز يا جفار يا قويم يا ستار يا رحيم يا جبار يا خالق يا بار اللهم أجرنا من النار يا مجير يا مجير يا مجير برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين آمين آمين يا رب العالمين لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له له الملك وله الحمد يحيي ويميت لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له